A little over a year ago, you guys found out that I really love dinosaurs. Very nice, very sweet. Oh, hold on, that's, uh, that's not it. That's, uh, that's a clip of me petting a goat. <laughs> I meant to put that in there. The clip I was supposed to show you is actually from last year when I kicked off my annual dinosaur video series. And if you haven't seen that one yet, don't worry about it. I basically just gave out your social security number and beat up your dad and stuff. Uh, he, he actually pooped himself. I spent last year's dinosaur video reviewing a movie called Jurassic Attack, a 2014 project that tried to bite off of Jurassic Park, but they couldn't really commit to the bit, so they just made it a Call of Duty storyline. It was pretty goddamn bad, but you have to remember that they were dealing with an extremely tight budget, and I'm pretty sure that all of it was filmed in the middle of Florida, so, you know, they were dealt a pretty bad hand. So what would happen if they did have a large budget? What if Jurassic Park didn't even exist? And most importantly, what if the movie wasn't actually that bad? No, you're supposed to be watching. Jesus fucking Christ. Adventures in Dinosaur City is an early 90s family film that actually predates Jurassic Park by a whole year, meaning at this time, the standard for a good dinosaur film didn't really exist yet. And just so we're clear, that standard was set by Steven Spielberg's other 1993 dinosaur film, uh, We Are Back, A Dinosaur Story. Hey, we talk about cinema on this channel, right? Don't get mad at me, all right? This movie is widely considered to be one of the worst dinosaur movies ever made, but I'm gonna be honest, I don't really understand that. So let's see what all this shit talk is about, because all I smell is poo, okay? Uh, well, no, that's me. I, I think I shit myself. Okay, so these opening credits actually rock, dude. It's like two and a half minutes of these cool hand-drawn slides set to some super brassy music. And look, I know I'm already giving this film a lot of credit right off the bat, uh, but don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. It's by no means perfect. In fact, the film wants us to warm up to a few odd concepts. Uh, the first one being that it wants us to believe that these three individuals are friends. Not siblings. <laughs> Best friends. <laughs> Two radical 90s teens and this child. Okay. The film would also like us to believe that these three are absolutely obsessed with dinosaurs. But not like, oh, sick science! Nah, more like, I have dinosaurs hanging from my ceiling. Also, I'm gonna read you my dino fan fiction. Ready to listen? You gotta be pulling my tail. That's your idea of a dinosaur story? Yeah, they didn't even fuck. So yeah, we're not gonna get any explanation on this relationship, but I can tell you their names, okay? We have Timmy, Mick, and Jamie. Timmy steals Jamie's diary with a distraction that only a 90s movie character would fall for. Arachnophobia alert! Where? And then he pretends to read a diary entry that says that Jamie has the hots for Mick, and even though it's a lie, <laughs> we learn that it's rather true. Oh, I am so in love with Mick. He's almost as handsome as Rex. Now, imagine how I felt watching that, still thinking they were brother and sister. Guys, I didn't question it. That's a problem. We're then introduced to two scientists working in a lab with indescribable gadgets. And really, I don't have a great way to describe uh, what they're about to do. Uh, so I'm just going to give it my best shot. Basically, they beam an orange into a TV. But because this was made in the 90s, the filmmakers had to show off every bit of their CGI capabilities. I mean, look at this. What is happening? Well, something happened because all of a sudden the orange comes flying out of the screen. And apparently that means that whatever they did, uh, it worked. We've done it. Then we cut back to the kids who are sitting down to watch their favorite TV show aptly named Dinosaurs. Now, normally in a scene like this, you'd have the characters sit down and kind of talk over the show, you know, talk about what they're watching. And hey, you know, they do do that, uh, but only after they roll the entirety of the opening credit sequence for the show. This sequence is super funny to me for a couple reasons. Uh, number one, the theme song basically consists of them just singing Dinosaurs over and over again. But every now and then it just cuts back to the kids absolutely busting it down in fact. <laughs> Fast motion. And I feel like this is very customary of 90s film. You know, they're always showing us something we don't need to see, but it makes the scene like 10 times better. This long-winded sequence becomes even funnier when we learn that the only reason Timmy put on the show was to show Jamie that she's a bad writer. See, Jamie, if you're gonna be a real writer, this is what you gotta write. Guys, I feel like I always end up getting to this point, but as much as I love the movie, I hate Timmy. I mean, he's already throwing off the vibe by being much younger than the other kids, but he's also an asshole. Like, stop. In the next scene, we learn that the scientists have a plane to catch, and then we learn that they're Timmy's parents. So now it would seem that Timmy's parents are leaving him alone for the weekend, which ushers in a classic parents leaving town scene. Normally this scene would be warranted, you know, he's a kid, uh, but based on his parents' personalities, I think Timmy might be better off on his own. What's wrong with watching cartoons? Wait, your mother's right, Tim. Uh, boy, your age should be out, oh, splitting atoms. <laughs> Get it? Because he, he's a scientist. Oh, oh no. 
No, please help me. And one more thing, you know, you gotta love this era of film, right? You know, it feels like we're right on the cusp of that transatlantic accent disappearing, but we still got a little bit of it. Once the parents head out, Timmy comes up with a volcanic idea. Hey guys. I got this volcanic idea. That idea is for them to sneak into the lab and watch dinosaurs on the big screen. Now it's odd, right? Because these kids, they love dinosaurs a lot, but they're so obsessed with the TV show that they're treating it like an addiction that they have to hide from the world. Somehow Timmy knows how to turn on all the equipment while simultaneously being the dumbest motherfucker on the planet. He's like, hey Mick, why don't you just toss that podium to the side so we can stand directly in front of this massive machine and as close to the TV as possible. I don't know, I just find it kind of funny because when they were sitting in the bedroom watching on the tiny TV, it was as if they were sitting as far away as they possibly could. Wow. Gripping. Yeah, man, uh, you should probably shut up because you're about to eat those words. Because as soon as the show comes on, so does the beam that they're standing directly in front of. Huh? What button did you push, Timmy? Shut it off! And right, he says that, but I don't really think he means it. Or maybe it just means stand still and do nothing, uh, because that's what they do. Whoa! 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 Oh, yeah, I'm just gonna step behind it, I guess. Huh? So this suck sequence obviously lasts for way too long, but it can't be denied that it's probably the most 90s sequence in the entire movie. I mean, the, the green screening, the CGI, it's perfect. It becomes a little concerning for a moment, though, when the sequence focuses on Mick. The other two kids are kind of just like, whoa, whoa, what's happening? Uh, but Mick is, uh, like, he's just fucking dying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it. Like, like, is he choking? It's interesting, though, because when they finally crash land through this door, Mick says, I feel nauseous. Weren't you just yakking for like a minute straight? Your, your, your tummy should feel good now. <laughs> Classic, classic. I mean, come on, come on. It's well executed, right? So this is Fori, one of the dino characters from the cartoon, and he rules, dude. If I were to pick one dino friend to accompany me on a journey, it would be this guy. I mean, like, listen to him talk. Hey, what in the hot lava is going on here? Now, you guys know me, all right? I hate characters that only exist to throw out random quips. But guys, this time we're dealing with a small Italian dinosaur. I'm, I'm sorry, let me say that again. A small Italian dino. I don't give a shit what this guy says to me as long as he knows a good bit spot in Brooklyn, I'm sold. Anyway, the gang sees this other gang approaching, so they run and hide. This is a gang of cavemen led by Link, the lead caveman, and honestly, if I had to pick one aspect of this movie that I don't like, uh, it's probably these guys. The first reason being that they play them like a group of popular high school kids. My, my, such hostility. <laughs> <laughs> and ill time too. And I don't really know why that bothers me so much, but it's just, it's not really playing for me. Second of all, you understood what he said in that first clip, right? Well, that's the only time you'll be able to understand him because otherwise he sounds like this. Mr. Big's been shutting the city down for a while. By the time somebody finished it once and for all. Anyway, the cavemen are here to steal this fuse, which I guess helps power Dinosaur City, but Fori warns them that stealing it will cause a citywide meltdown. Guess they don't care. Oh yeah, and the final thing that I don't like about this gang, and I guess this movie in general, are moments like this. Wow. <laughs> I truly cannot recall the last time I saw a genuine ahoga moment, but here we are. Yeah, the movie's gonna do stuff like this a couple more times, uh, and I'm gonna point it out, but it's also important to remember that this film is super dated. You could never get away with this today. <laughs> You could never- They managed to sneak past this caveman while he's sleeping, only to just now realize that the power is out. But I'm not gonna let these dumb hacks fool me, because I know for a fact that they just watched that entire situation go down. I'll take fatal mistakes for a thousand, Jamie. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, well, they basically end up blaming Timmy for all of this, and I mean, they're goddamn right. Then we cut to this establishing shot of this huge dino compound that is, I mean, just- billowing smoke out of its blowholes. I really don't even know what I'm looking at right now, but it can't be good for whatever environment this is. So now they're entering a new structure. Uh, let's see what they've been chatting about. Timmy, this is all your fault. Are you crazy? Ha, <laughs> dude, he's such a fucking dick. I hate it. Get a life, Mick. We're in dinosaurs for roaring out loud. Hey, hey! That's what I'm saying. Fuck this guy. What a crazy way to follow up the statement, get a life. Like, I, I don't even know if that actually makes sense. He brings up a good point, though, in saying that they know literally everything about this cartoon, meaning that they have a pretty decent chance of getting out alive. They finally meet back up with Fori, who lets them know that lava is rising and people are about to explode. Mick thinks this is a great time to ask Fori for an autograph, and instead of even addressing it, Fori's just like, yeah, anyway, I'm gonna die soon. You're kind of my hero. 
Right. I'm probably gonna die under molten lava in 24 hours. But Timmy's like, no. That's not what happens in the cartoon. So they need to get to Tar Town, but because the train system has been taken over by the cavemen who are called the Rockies, uh, they have no way of getting there. That is until Jamie spots a path on this conveniently placed map on the wall that goes directly through an area called Extinction Grove. Extinction Grove? What? No, no! Whoa, time out. Graveyard? Wait, let me think. No. Wait guys, hold on a second. Uh. No. They conclude that because this path is unknown to them, it must be from an episode that they haven't seen yet. So that means that their survival rate has decreased by mm, about 70%. And you're coming with us whether you like it or not. Oh, hey, put him down. What are you doing? He didn't agree to that. We cut back to another establishing shot of that same structure. And, oh, God, sorry. Oh, he smoked that. Oh. In this next scene, we get to meet the main villain of the story, uh, and he's actually pretty terrifying. I'll have no more foolish games from you idiots. Do I make my Clear. Yeah, that terror lasts for about five seconds until you realize that his name is Mr. Big. The dude's literally dressed like a Sith Lord. That's like calling him Darth Large. Um, nothing actually happens in that scene. Quite literally, he just yells at some Rockies and they run away. But hey, you know, it's a short and sweet, right? You can't complain. The kids end up having to break through the gates of Extinction Grove with a stick. And when they do that, they continue to walk through this spooky forest. By the way, anyone who said that this movie is bad was clearly not paying any attention. And I haven't even pointed it out yet, but have you guys been seeing how crazy these sets are. Say what you will about the acting or the editing, but I mean, there was some real love put into many aspects of this film. Like, look, while they're walking through the forest, Timmy comes across this sick dino Grim Reaper statue and then just walks away. We're never going to see it again, but it looks fucking epic. And here I am talking about it 30 years later. I mean, that's money well spent, if you ask me. They end up reaching this bridge made of dino bones, which once again looks so dope. Oh, I love water. Oh yeah. Just love it. Bring on some more for me, huh? Wow, this guy sure talks about water a lot. You guys think he's gonna fall in the water? Just go! Uh, me! Jimmy, do something! Well, judging by the looks of whatever that is, I think he's a goner. Okay, not really, but something does latch onto his leg, preventing him from getting out. And I say something mainly because the movie is so old and the quality is so diminished that you can't even tell what it is. I managed to find an AI upscaled version of the movie on YouTube, and even then, you cannot tell what this specimen is. It just looks like an organism that only knows suck. By the way, while Timmy beats the ever-loving Christ out of this thing, Jamie, for some reason, is screaming, Ow! <laughs> No sense, but I love it. We do end up getting a good look at the creature as it rises out of the water behind Jamie. It's funny because it actually looks rather friendly. Uh, that must be why Mick decides to scream with the most indecisive expression. Ah! Ah! They finally make it to Tar Town, though, and I gotta say, it's literally Star Wars. I mean, look at this. They literally do a Star Wars wipe into the establishing shot. Some would call this copying, but because I respect this film, I'm going to call it inspiration. Then they arrive at the Tar Town Tavern. Not Teach you to cheat, you <laughs> Yeah, this movie fucking rocks, dude. And the entire scene that's about to take place is the epitome of why I love this movie, so I really need you to pay attention. Hey, I, I just saw you minimize the screen. What are you doing there? As soon as we're shown the interior of the bar, we meet these guys. And I mean, come on. Come on! But when the kids enter, it is exactly like that scene from the SpongeBob movie. You know the one I'm talking about. Just watch. <laughs> What are those? Oh, my. Oh, what a bunch of freaks. I love those little guys. What are they? Anyway, they go back to business as usual, but not before we get introduced to this dino sex worker. Looking for action, big boy. <laughs> Not really sure why they decided to throw that in, but remember, you know, pretty dated. But don't breathe yet, though, because almost immediately we get launched into a cavewoman cabaret number complete with full choreography. Guys, I'm telling you, this film is a masterpiece. The sex worker dino shoves Mick's head into her dino breast, Jamie gets tossed around by this other dino, and Flory and Timmy investigate this cocktail that just looks like a steaming tower of meat flaps. That's another thing about this movie. Like, multiple times we're shown indescribable things, but because the quality quality of the film is so low, you just kind of have to accept defeat and move on. Makes you think less, you know? But I gotta know what was sucking on that guy's foot. They end up spotting two other characters from the cartoon, Tops and Rex, at a poker table. This is one of those situations where one party is like, you guys gotta help us! And then the other party is like, okay, yeah, right. The Rockies have taken almost everything we have, and now they're gonna melt the city down! 
Right. I'll bring the marshmallows. Then Timmy pulls that bullshit again where he's like, no, 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 no. But remember in episode 57 where you fucked the- But this time it's not just Timmy. Even Jamie's getting passionate about it. So much to the point that she calls Rex a coward and it kind of gets to him. All of a sudden though, a group of Rockies busts into the bar. Once again with an incredible henchman as leader. Now I heard all the Tyrannosaurs were dead. Oh, by the way, I just realized we haven't gotten to hear Rex talk yet. Uh, listen to this sick burn he does. I know you Rockies don't have tail brains like sores but I always thought you had at least one brain. Oh, 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 he, uh, he sounds pretty sad. But after the henchman tries to get his roast in, yo, let's go. And now we've arrived at the bar fight scene, which guys, I could not love more. The fight choreography in this scene single-handedly sweeps every Marvel project from the last four years, and I am not kidding. Oh, oh, let her go. Oh, Jesus. Oh, he's flying. Yo, get him. Oh. It's an absolute dog pile, but guys, it's so well done. This is gonna sound super corny, I know, but watching this fight scene really did make me realize just how creative fight scenes were before we started using CGI. In fact, we literally have people flying across the room and it's all practical. My favorite fighter definitely has to be Tops, though. I mean, we'll see a little more later, but every now and then he'll just hit the most insane combo. Give me claw! Oh shit! They, they said it! That's the thing from the poster! Apparently this fight was enough to get Rex back into the game though, because as soon as it's over, they head out. We then cut back to Mr. Big's compound, uh, and this is the first scene that feels purely informational. We get to hear Mr. Big talk a little more though, uh, and it quickly becomes apparent that he is very, very volatile. It's, it's so odd. And I don't care what condition we take them in. Do I make myself clear now? Like, I know villains are supposed to be damaged and vengeful, but it kind of just feels like this guy is being evil because he wants to be evil. Well, We'll talk about that more later though. Uh, let's see this next scene. <laughs> oh God, holy shit, dude. Fuck. The kids now accompanied by Rex and Tops arrive at the gates of Sore City and they come across this one extra dino losing his mind. <laughs> Coming. And from this, we learn that the city has begun to evacuate. They end up at this treehouse, which apparently the kids know about. Like, I guess it's supposed to be some iconic location from the cartoon. But here's my thing, dude. If you wanted us to react the same way that the kids just did, you could have established, like, any of this. No, no, no. Instead, you guys just wanted to shove dinosaurs down our throat for a minute and a half. On a serious note, though, uh, that is another complaint that I have. I do wish we knew a little bit more about what made these characters and locations so iconic. Anyway, the movie actually gets super quiet for the next few minutes, uh, other than the occasional on-the-nose joke. Yeah, only thing missing is Tarzan. But once they finally get the place lit up, they all sit around and discuss life. Yep. Three teenagers and a group of dinosaurs. When Rex asks them to tell him about their world, they, now don't get me wrong, they do describe it, but they give examples that A, wouldn't make sense to a dinosaur, and B, don't fucking matter. I am bookstores, lots of people, and grandparents. My English teacher, Mr. Hamm. Mick gets super upset out of nowhere, which kind of breaks up the conversation, but this breaks us up into two parallel conversations, one between Rex and Timmy, and one between Mick and Jamie. Mick is basically like, I don't want to go home. I'm a loser at home. But to prove otherwise, Jamie kisses him way too hard. Timmy, on the other hand, doesn't want to go home simply because it's boring. So you know what? <laughs> I'll take it. Okay, so now we're back to Mr. Big. Remember how I said that I felt like he was just being evil to be evil? Yeah, well, take a look at this. Allosaurus shall rule the world once more. The reign of terror begins. And I feel like this is a very common phrase, right? Reign of terror. Why, why do so many villains say this? Because I feel like most villains, with the exception of a few, you know, they always have some sort of justification. That's why they don't realize that they're being evil. But when you post up and basically say, all right, let's be super mean. It's gonna be fun. It doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Regardless though, he looks super menacing. So I'm just gonna shut up. <laughs> Rex takes Timmy to the heart of Skull Island, which apparently used to be the center of Sore City. There he shows Timmy a statue of his father and basically gives him a full lore rundown. All right, I'm gonna try my best here to, to, to break it down for you. Here we go. So there were these evil dinosaurs and then there were good dinosaurs and then one day the evil dinos turned on the good dinos and then the good dinos won but one of the bad dinos survived and that was Mr. Big and now we're here. Oh God, I can't breathe. This conversation has a pretty awkward ending though so I'll show you that. When they get back to the treehouse, they get ambushed by a bunch of Rockies and it's an all out brawl. Once again, I find it to be incredibly gripping and entertaining due to the fact that there's no CGI. Man, if only someone in this scene got really mad and then pulled out every Marvel superpower, that, that would be so cool. 
Oh shit, wait, it's uh, it's the dance. You, oh, you guys think they're gonna do the- Give me the wand. Oh shit, yeah, let's go. There's this one Rocky that corners Timmy alone. And for the first time in the film, Timmy decides to re-employ that remote that got them there. It ends up just being like the remote from Click. Uh, remember Click? It's pretty overpowered and Mr. Big thinks it's gonna get in the way of his plan. So he, I mean, he really wants it. I want it badly. I want it now, Link. No! Well, that means Timmy has to get kidnapped, and this is a rather concerning situation, right? Well, not really, because from what it seems, they only care about the goddamn remote. They'll take it to Mr. Big, and then we're really in trouble. Okay, but can you blame them, though? Like, it's so overpowered. They need that to win the movie. Uh, just a little side note here. The remote that literally freezes and manipulates time runs on AA batteries. Holy shit. In the next scene, the gang infiltrates Mr. Big's compound disguised as Rockies, and remember this... They're sneaking in. So who in the writer's room said, Hey, guys, we didn't use my joke yet. Would it be okay if we just kind of threw it in? It doesn't matter if it makes sense. Hey, Mick, is that Ramparinkus in your coat? Or are you just happy to see me? I I'm sorry. Shut the fuck up. So now they're all talking full volume. That's great. Uh, but then Tops comes up with an idea that's super awesome. They strip Jamie down and send her out as a piece of meat to distract the Rockies. Hey guys, why don't we do another bit about women, you know, and how they make sex to us, <laughs> you know? My wife left this morning. Rex actually ends up finding his dad in this dungeon. Uh, I don't know if the movie ever said that he died, but it, it sort of felt implied. For some reason, he's super weak though. And as soon as he sees his son again, he's like, well, time to go sacrifice myself. And Rex is like father they finally go upstairs to find timmy being dangled over a green fire pit and then we get launched into the final battle timmy! at the very end of the battle mr big gets uh, i don't know like i guess he gets deleted Later, dude Before he steals the fuse back, learns how to fly again, and oh yeah, he didn't know how to fly before. I didn't tell you that, but yeah, he didn't know how to fly. He does now though, so that's that's great, right? Well, yeah, pretty much, except for the fact that Rex's dad blows up the whole place after everyone's been defeated. <laughs> God damn, that sucks. The ending is pretty predictable, honestly. You know, Jamie and Mick come out as new, powerful people. Timmy, of course, doesn't want to leave. Then they do the dance, look really stupid, and go home. I don't want it to be over though. I don't want the dinosaur video to be over. Come on, I even had a dinosaur thing on here the whole time. The dinosaur video is so glorious. I, I've waited so long to do this again. You know, I got my dino gear on today. Hope you guys noticed. Hope you think I look cool. I love this movie. If you hated it, then you suck, okay? This movie is a classic, and I think it's misunderstood. So, wah, wah, wah. Ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like and comment and subscribe and just interact overall, okay? It's the bare minimum. Well, guys, that's uh, all I have for you this time. But until next time. All right, dino video done, I guess. Oh, wow, we're learning the anatomy of this, uh, this prehistoric mammal right now. I wonder what it is. Oh, it's, it's pretty cute. That's a cute render. All right, I'm, I'm done now. Goodbye.